All right, who is next? Let's have a look. Thank you, Beck. Mr. Ilan Osborne from California. Welcome, sir. Ilan, I'm going to ask you 10 simple questions and I'd like for you to be as honest as possible. When did you realize you had the home theater bug and what made you start a YouTube channel? I've always been a film buff since I was a kid. I loved when my parents brought home a movie to watch from Blockbuster or even going to Blockbuster on a Friday night with my friends. But on top of that, I grew up in a musical family, so music and sound were a big part of my childhood. I always had a love for the sound design in Star Wars and even loved trying to mimic those sounds when I was playing with friends. So you could say that my world as a whole was built around a sonic foundation of music and audio from an early age. Fast forward to being an adult on my own, I always knew I wanted a nice home theater since I loved cinema and the process of filmmaking. I'm one of those geeks who likes to watch behind the scenes footage and bonus content on a Blu-ray or even listen to the audio commentary of the director. But the bug truly hit me when we moved into our current home because in the living room, it already had four speakers in the ceiling and one center channel in the wall for a nice surround sound experience, right? But I knew right when I saw those in-ceiling speakers, I thought, those will someday be my Atmos height channels. Then, when I got the Klipsch 5.1 reference theater pack last summer for my birthday, I snaked some wires down the walls from the attic and finally had my 5.1.4 Dolby Atmos setup. I always knew I wanted to have a YouTube channel because I've always been a goofy dude who likes to entertain people. It is recommended that it is... Anywho, the speakers do... No. Anywho. 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 Any. The Costco bundle does say that it comes with five sets of speaker wire. Speaker with a G. S-P-E-A-G-E-R, speaker. And I had some audio related videos that nobody had any interest in, so it wasn't growing much at all. But when I decided to do a YouTube review on that new Clips Reference Theater Pack, boom. That's what viewers were actually searching for. So I decided to ride that train and continue to create videos revolving around home theater since I already had a passion for movies, audio, and music. And that was September 2020, and it continued to grow quickly when the 2020 holiday shopping season was in full effect. How do you feel about 4K discs? And do you think there will always be a future in physical media? Since I was born in the early 80s, I think I'll always have a love for physical media. But since I'm an audiophile, I went to school for audio engineering and also composed music on the side, I can tell the difference between a Dolby Atmos track through streaming service like Netflix or HBO Max versus a 4K Blu-ray Atmos track on a disc. I know eventually that bandwidths will increase and streaming audio will improve to damn near bit perfect quality compared to a physical disc, but I do enjoy the fact that I can pop in a disc anytime I want and know that it's mine. Streaming services are always changing their libraries, so you never know which movie will be available and which one won't. So having a collection of your favorites on disc, I think, is always a good thing to have with the convenience of streaming services. And just like how vinyl records are making a comeback with music, I feel like there will always be those who prefer a physical disc over its streaming counterpart, even in the year 2050. And I'll be one of them. What's your thoughts on box speakers versus in-wall speakers? And what is your favorite brand of choice and why? When I first moved into this house, I knew I wanted to have a complete in-wall and in-ceiling system. It looks clean, my wife doesn't like the look of bulky speakers in the living room, and my girls won't accidentally run into them, stub their toe, etc. But now that I've reviewed some other speakers, I think I honestly might prefer boxed speakers now. Granted, my channel is still fairly new and I've only been able to personally listen to a select few speaker brands out there, but the whole design behind an in-wall speaker is having that front baffle that depends on being anchored to a wall itself to produce mid and mid bass frequencies. They have a particular sound to them because of that. And after having reviewed the Aperion Audio Novus line, which isn't even their top of the line model, I do prefer knowing that so much thought went into engineering not only the tweeter or the woofers, but the cabinet itself and how sound will bounce and reverberate inside of it 
as opposed to sound possibly bouncing around an open wall cavity. No house is alike, so I like the peace of mind knowing that the result of the whole engineering process is a speaker that will reproduce the same audio characteristics no matter where it's placed. Not to mention, even high-end in-wall speakers typically can only handle up to 150 watts. So in my ideal home theater situation, I'd hope to have at least a front stage speaker that can handle more than 150 watts. Are you a DC or a Marvel fan? And if you were a superhero character, what would you be? Oh, Marvel all the way, baby. I was very into reading Uncanny X-Men back in the 90s, not only for the storyline, but also for the artwork by Joe Madrera. Drawing was actually my first art form that I embraced as a kid, being known as the kid who could draw throughout my entire undergraduate education. Even getting into trouble with some teachers who thought I wasn't paying attention as I was drawing in the margins of my notebooks. But the Marvel stories about ordinary humans who obtain extraordinary powers or who are gifted with mutant powers from birth really resonated with me. I've always loved Spider-Man's powers, especially with his super strength and agility, being able to climb walls. Not so much the swinging around on webs part, because I've never been much of an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> But Nightcrawler I also liked a lot, being able to teleport. So if I had it my way, I'd have Spider-Man's agility, super strength, and wall climbing abilities combined with teleportation. I feel like that would be an incredible superhero. If you were shopping for an AV receiver in 2021, what are the main features that's a must for you? After reviewing the Basics A5, I personally would have to get a receiver that had pre-outs so I could hook up some external amps to it. HDMI 2.1 and HDCP 2.3 aren't as important to me right now since I'm not a hardcore gamer and I just like to watch TV shows and movies in 4K quality in Dolby Atmos. So getting a future-proof receiver isn't that important to me right now since none of the high-end preamps even support HDMI 2.1 or 8K resolution yet and I plan on eventually owning one of those in a few years. But taking full advantage of a receiver's capabilities to me means powering all the channels externally now that I know firsthand what a difference it makes. I understand that means spending at least 1300 for example, the Denon X3700H or better, but I would save up for something like that in 2021 since external amps are now a lot more affordable. Do you believe that budget equipment can actually sound just as good as middle class with the correct placement of speakers, power amplification, and room acoustics? Or do you believe in you get what you pay for? I believe there is a bell curve when it comes to budget versus high-end equipment. You do get what you pay for when it comes to cheap speakers. The power they can handle, the frequency response, and if they add any unnecessary coloration to the audio. You do have a point though, where even budget speakers can still sound great with proper acoustic treatment around the room, correct speaker placement, and any EQ settings to help any room nodes or other anomalies since no room is the same. But there is a point at which the amount of money you spend on speakers hits a peak compared to how good they actually sound. I've never personally heard tower speakers in the front stage of a home theater that cost $10,000 each, yet. But at least for now, I can't imagine they sound that much better than a tower costing $1,000. Receivers, on the other hand, I know for a fact that you definitely get what you pay for. I've personally had an Onkyo TX-NR787 for a few years now, and I can hear its limitations, especially during action scenes where so much audio is happening around the soundstage at once. The audio gets compressed and dialogue gets a little quieter and all the sounds just kind of get jumbled together into one massive audio blob. But after reviewing the Emotiva Basics A5 and using a Denon X4700H on loan, now I totally understand the benefit of having one component doing the audio and video processing and a separate component powering the speakers. It opens up everything and increases the level of detail when everything is happening at once on screen. Dialogue, sound effects, bass response, music, etc. Budget receivers can only handle so much before they reach their limits. But you don't know what you're missing until you hear it in person. It's wild. Projector with a big screen or a huge TV and why? In a dedicated home theater, projector with a screen all day. 
since you have much more control over the lighting situation and the fact that it's much darker in a space like that. And the sheer size of it really sells the theater aspect of a home theater. And let's not forget about the cost factor. 100 inch, 120 inch, 150 inch screen. An OLED TV that size would cost a couple hundred grand, right? In a living room though, a large TV for sure. You'll have windows to deal with, lighting that changes throughout the day. So the brightness of a TV always wins in that scenario. If you were to build the ultimate dedicated home theater room, give me a rough picture of what it would look like and what equipment you would use. Honestly, it would look a lot like your home theater did that you just took apart, but with a few differences. I'd have two rows of nice reclining seats with the second row being a little bit elevated from the first. Some nice acoustic treatment on the sides, the ceiling, and a quadratic diffuser in the rear. But if money were no issue, here's some of my equipment must-haves. An 8K projector with a 150-inch acoustically transparent screen with a recessed wall cavity behind the screen to put my front soundstage in. I was a Klipsch fan at the onset of my home theater obsession because they seem to have the best quality introductory speakers for those wanting to get into dedicated home theaters without having to spend 80 or $100,000. And what caught my attention early was their 7.2 THX Ultra 2 speaker system. Is it really worth $13,000? I have no idea, but I'd love to find out. So that would be my bed layer of speakers. And for my high channels, I'd go with an array of several RP500SA Atmos speakers, and here's why. I really started to get into RO3D, or at least it's really piqued my curiosity. So I want to make sure my setup is configured in such a way where it can support Dolby Atmos, DTSX Pro, and RO3D without having to move any speakers. I saw Black Widow in the movie theater a couple weekends ago, which was the first movie I'd seen in a theater since before COVID-19 happened. And I noticed almost all the Atmos speakers were on the sides pointing down. There were a couple in the ceiling, sure, but most were in the corners on the side. So that actually works well with an RO3D configuration, having a bed layer, a second layer almost matching the bed layer, and then one Voice of God speaker straight above the listening position. So having those angled RP5000SA speakers will work very well in that scenario. It seems like the absolute pinnacle of home theater preamps out there are made by Trinoff. So I definitely get one of those if I had an unlimited budget along with some NAD external amplifiers maybe. A Panasonic UB9000 4K Blu-ray player, Xbox Series X. Since Microsoft seems to be more audio focused than Sony, always being the first to adopt new audio technologies as they roll out. Do you have any short-term or long-term goals for the YouTube channel? A little teaser for the audience? For my short-term goals for my channel, I'm almost done tinkering around with some new things and I'm excited to reveal them soon. It's not going to be a completely different look and feel, but I do want to steer my videos towards being an actual show rather than just an educational YouTube video. I'll have more graphics on screen at all times, jumping from one topic to the next. I just got a teleprompter. So recording and editing the talking head portion will be more efficient, allowing for more time during the editing process for more creativity or B-roll footage. I'd love to start implementing live streams, either with a special guest or me just talking about a time sensitive subject with anyone who wants to join the conversation. I want to have more little bits of content for those who have joined my Patreon as well. A more long-term goal is that I'd love to have podcasts, but not exactly related to my channel. It's a secret for now, but hopefully it'll come to fruition here in the next year or so, which I hope to get big enough to get on some national tours, having live shows of the podcast with an audience, that kind of thing. And ultimately, I'd love to host a home theater or tech-related TV show run by one of the many streaming services out there, complete with a writer's room, and graphic design staff, etc. Are you familiar with Patriot Act with Hassan Minhaj? Or Last Week Tonight with John Oliver? Yeah, something like that, but for tech and audio. And last but not least, for all them beginners starting out, what would be the one advice you can give them? I understand that not everyone can have a dedicated home theater room or that 
You live in an apartment and can't have some bombastic home theater system annoying your neighbors. But my advice to any beginner out there is to start with a good old fashioned budget receiver and wired speaker system. I know sound bars are the rage, but once you get that home theater bug, having a receiver and passive speakers is a great investment that you can easily build upon and upgrade as time goes on. Sound bars, you can't really upgrade. And my one big beef with soundbar systems in general is that they are inherently buggy. Wireless technology, ARC and eARC, has come a long way but still needs a lot of improvement. But a receiver and wired speakers? Even though the initial setup is more time consuming than a soundbar, the end result is much more reliable and something you can count on to just work when you turn it on. And speakers are a great investment. That technology has been around for 100 plus years, just requiring an electrical charge to move a magnetic driver back and forth to reproduce sound waves. So they usually last a long time and still hold their value if you decide to sell them later on when you upgrade to even better speakers. Win-win. Physical media still rules. Audio is just as important, if not more important than video. And wired systems are the way to do it, my friends. Wow. Impressive Mr. Osborne, are you sure you're not born in Australia? I mean, you clearly know how to tell a story. Your knowledge is through the roof. But do me a favor, can you say Down Under Sarkis? Down Under Sarkis? <laughs> Congratulations and welcome. Tell the others to go home, we found our guide.